Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you to our second installment of our Quality Improvement Research Boot Camp. And um, before we get started with this second version, I just want to draw your attention to, let me turn, pull this down a little, our upcoming um, events that we have. We have our third and fourth installments, our third in May. Um, we have Steve Davis and Dr. Vaskard who will address IRB and how that plays into quality improvement research. It should be very informative, hopefully interactive as well. So we'll hope you'll come and bring your colleagues with you for that. And then the last segment we're putting off till July. And this is going to be a very productive session, which will also include a focused workshop. So if you have QI data, if you will be getting QI data, or if you anticipate that in the future, um, we can work with you. Actually, a leading expert in publishing QI work will be here working with you with your publications or providing a case study so that we all benefit from that and have that, those skills. So um, I want to introduce our speakers today. If you were here before, you already met Dr. Greg Barreto. Um, he um, and Dr. Erica Shaver will be talking about really the um, nuts and bolts of planning a QI project. And so a little bit of background, Dr. Bretto is the Medical Director for Performance Improvement, WVU Healthcare Children's Hospital. He's also the Fellowship Program Director in Neonatal and Perinatal Medicine. Um, he received his Doctor of Medicine in 2000 in the Philippines, his residency in 2005 in pediatrics at Cooper University Hospital in New Jersey, his fellowship training at Penn State College for Medicine in 2008. Um, that's in neonatal and perinatal medicine. And then we have um, Dr. Shaver, who's an assistant professor in the emergency medicine program, and she's also a res an associate residency uh, director there. She received her Doctor of Medicine in 2008 from Joan C. Edwards School of Medicine at Marshall University. And her residency was conducted here at West Virginia University from 2008 to 2011 in emergency medicine. And so she's been a leader within her department of um, helping to instill and develop QI projects and also working with Greg um, kind of in developing a um, QI program um, overarching within the hospital. So I'll let them talk to you about that. All right. Um, I guess good afternoon. So, um, so, so the nuts and bolts of QI, unfortunately, one of the disclaimers we'll have is uh, I can't, we can't make you experts when you leave this door. Um, this entails an entire workshop of a couple of days to actually go through. So we're summarizing days of information, hours of information in terms of one hour. Um, so just today's overview, we said it's QI. And it really is just asking the six whys. It's why do we need to do this? Why is this important? Who needs to be involved? Who's involved in terms of our patients? Who does the QI projects? Um, what do we need to do? Where do we begin? When do we begin? Where and when? And the last one is how do we do this right? So I'll start over with um, last month, um, a month ago, Mike Sweet and I, he's the Director of Quality Outcomes over at um, WVUH. We kind of looked at you know, what the whys. We tried to answer the whys. And one is it's a requirement. JCO, you have a lot of abbreviations. JCO, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance companies are now requiring this, and even the public. And an example I'll show you, now this image is, is blurred, but I'm actually focusing it later on. But this is just a summary. So this came from Consumer Reports. These are all the hospitals in West Virginia that Consumer Reports play, um, put in. So we're just like the car industry now. You go to Consumer Reports, and when you focus, these are the top 11 hospitals there. And they said, this is the safety score of your hospital. Started with St. Francis Hospital um, with a score of 68 out of 100, and we actually fall at number 10, at 51 over 100. So this is consumer, this is public reporting. There's several websites that are publicly reported data already. And there's actually no way to, to correct this data, because if you were to compare our hospital here, there's a big difference in size, the type of patients that we see, yet we're being compared at similar levels to the public. So if you were to access consumer reports and you're not a healthcare worker and this is what you see, would you actually go to West Virginia University Hospital? 
So we, we talked about the public. And you know, at the end, regard, you put aside all the requirements, everything we need to do, it really is the right thing to do. It's just good or even excellent patient care. Now for WVOH, one of the things, so this is again, just a summary. Our own hospital has its performance improvement plan. Um, and if I were to focus on quality and safety, they're looking at readmission rates, they're looking at C. diff rates, Clostridium diff, fissile. So this is a certain infection that some of our patients get while they're in the hospital. Um, they're also looking at patient satisfaction or the patient experience of improving that. So our own, our own institution is trying to do their part. A lot of this is, um, it's both driven by the, be, being the right thing to do, but it's also driven by penalties. There's going to be millions and, millions and millions of dollars of penalties associated with not being able to reach these goals. Now, I work in the NICU, so I take care of tiny babies when they're newborns from really small ones that are maybe a little less than a pound to the big ones with problems. And so in our NICU, this is what we do. So this is a snapshot of our how our NICU is doing. And I'll explain this graph to you. What this means really is anything above this black line. So these are all dots of different things from infection, from lung disease, morbidities. These are complications of being a premature baby. And if you do this black line, any dot above this black line, it means we're not doing well. What it means is this black line, which is one, is if I were to be compared to the 900 NICUs that send data to them, if I fall under one, then that means the likelihood of this baby getting this type of complication is equivalent to the entire, to the average of the, the network, the 900 NICUs we belong to in that network. But if I'm above it, so if you look at this at two, this is around 1.5. So your baby that gets admitted to my NICU where I work at has a 1.5 times higher chance of getting that complication. So again, it's the same question. If the public knew this, if you knew this, would you send your, your patient, your relative to us? Um, so all those red marks, and if you look, that's almost all of them. If we looked at our infection rate in the NICU, this is 2002 to 2008. So the red line here represents the network. Again, that's the 800, 900 plus NICUs. And this is 30, 35, this is us, this blue line. And anything above that red line is not good either. And you see for, for what, almost six years, from 2000 to 2008, we're not doing very well. Um, Cons infection, this is a type of bacteria that, it's actually in our skin. For, for us, it, it doesn't make us sick. It's a normal bacteria in our skin, but for tiny babies that we take care of, this, they could be very, very sick from this. And VLBW, sorry, I didn't explain that one earlier. That's very low birth weight. This means these are babies that are less than 1,500 grams is the ones we take care of. And look at that type of infection. It's all above that red line. It's almost twice that number. So let me head you over to Erica. So as Greg has um, started off the, the lecture today, he's telling us why QI is important um, and giving you some great examples of where he has worked with QI in the NICU um, and the results that he has achieved because of his QI projects. It's important to every department and it's important to the hospital as well and our hospital is graded um, upon this, so to speak. So by nature, it's important to everyone who works at the hospital to get a general understanding of this. So I'm going to start off my section by giving you this quote from the Institute of Medicine from 2001 and it says, between the health care we have and the care we could have lies not just a gap but a chasm and I think that really paints a picture for us of where we are now and where we're looking to go to the future and really the the bridge that will kind of go between this um, here and now is really a quality improvement curriculum and understanding the basic knowledge about quality improvement so that's a little bit what we're going to talk about in this next section so the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which we refer to a lot, known as the IHI, is a very well-established organization that focuses on quality improvement and in particular patient safety as well. And quality improvement and patient safety we think of as kind of going hand in hand, and that is somewhat true, um, but they're each their own, they're each their own section of um, knowledge and baseline skills to build. So the three must-haves in the IHI's mantra of quality improvement is that you first off, you must have the will to improve. So you have to be motivated 
motivated and be um, excited about trying to improve. The second is that you must have ideas about the alternatives to the status quo. So status quo is what we do every day. We do it because we did it the day before. And we kind of have to get out of that theory of doing it the same way that we've always done it just because that's the way it's been done. So we really have to be a little innovative about coming up with new ideas um, to the status quo. Then after we're motivated, after we have new ideas, we actually have to make it real and execute our plan. So those are steps one, two, and three. And in order to achieve unprecedented and sustained system results, because system results are really what you're talking about with QI, unlike a lot of things that we do individually as far as promotion and things like that, that's an individual thing. But QI really is trying to change an entire system involving multiple people. So in order to change it at the system level, you have to make it real and execute it, as it says here in number three. So then we ask, how do we actually make it real? It's easier said than done, obviously, as with many things in life. So the engine for making it real is actually using this framework called the Model for Improvement. And it's more referred to as the MFI. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We have a short video here to introduce you to the Model for Improvement, and then we're going to talk in detail about it in the next few slides. Um, this Model for Improvement video is actually from the IHI, so it's a sample of the videos that you can access from the site. And we'll talk a little bit about it later, how we can all access and use these free open resources that we have. Every, Every time, time you start, start out on, on a journey, journey whether it be by land or, or sea, you need, you need to, to have, have some way to guide your journey, some roadmap, a compass, if you will, that gives you direction and gives you some sort of sense of where you're going. Well, we have that at the IHI. It's called the Model for Improvement. The model for improvement gives us the foundation and the framework for doing improvement work. It is really structured around several key components, basically two major sections of the model for improvement. First of all, what is your aim? How will you know that a change in improvement is the second question, which gets to measurement. The third question deals with what changes can you actually put in place to achieve the aim. So these three things continually loop together. We always check ourselves against our aim. How good by when is typically one of the things we ask in the name statement. How good do you want to be? And then by when? It's not, it's not good, good enough, enough just to say that we want to be in the top decile, top quartile, but, but by when? when? Let's, Let's give a date. date. The measures. Are, are you going to look at process and an outcome measures? And then, then what changes are you actually going to put into place that you can track with data and then match back up against your aim? This then gets carried out in daily work with the team through something called the PDSA cycle or plan do, study, and act. The three questions give us the framework that we always go back to. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know a change and improvement? And what changes can we actually make? PDSA cycles is where we do our testing on a day-to-day -day basis. We go out and we take the ideas, we put them into a PDSA cycle, we plan it, we do it, we study it, that, that is, we get the data, data we come back up and look at this question, and then, then we act. That is, we're, we're going to change our plan based on the feedback we obtained, and then we're going to go through another cycle. This, this then becomes, becomes our model and our framework for how we're going to actually carry out improvement, improvement strategies. It gives us our guide and our roadmap. Our Great, so that video really serves as a kind of an introduction for what we're going to talk about in these next few slides. And please understand that the model for improvement is just one framework that you can use. I think it's the most commonly used one um, because it's most generalizable. So there's other frameworks that you can use. I'm sure everyone's heard of Six Sigma. That's one that's talked about a lot in quality improvement. Or there's also one called the Lean Model, or also known as the Toyota Production Service Model. So it's geared more towards customer service. Six Sigma is geared more towards decreasing 
increasing defect rates, but the model for improvement can really be used to obtain any goal that you want. So that's why we're choosing to talk about this one because it's pretty readily available out there. There's a lot of information on it and it's commonly um, used. So the model for improvement or the MFI is really our engine for change. It's really our way that we can use this framework to get what we want, to get from here to there, from where we are now to where we hope to be in the future. It's appropriate for all types of improvement efforts, like I discussed just a second ago, the Six Sigma and the Lean are more specific for certain causes where this framework can be broadly applied. And we actually do this pretty much in our everyday life. We just don't think of it like this. We're doing QI all the time. We just don't think of it outside of the setting of QI talks. Um, we do it at home, we do it in our morning routine, we do it in raising our children, we do it in any clinical setting at work, whether whether department you work in, um, the emergency department where I work, or if you work in the ICU, or if you work in the NICU, um, if you work in the PICU, the MICU, if you work um, in the family medicine outpatient clinic, like every setting that you work in, you can apply this um, framework to, and every setting will have different goals. In the emergency departments, in the emergency department, we might want to decrease our door to EKG time, or we might want to decrease the time it takes to collect a urine on a patient. Or you might want to um, you know, prevent a wrong medication administration. So those are just some examples from my workplace, but these can apply broadly to any setting that you work on. So it's really composed of three questions plus the PDSA cycle, and the three questions are the AIMS measures changes, plus your PDSA cycle leads towards your model for improvement, and it's a very simple but powerful tool. So if we can really understand this, then that will allow us to get from here to there. So the model for improvement, our AIM says what we are trying to accomplish. So it's much like a goal and objective when you make a lecture, you're starting off with ideas of where you want to be at the end of that lecture. So at a QI project, you're starting off with an AIM, and that really is kind of the grounding feature of the project and where you're trying to go. Then you talk about your measures and as the video mentioned the measures are how we will know that what we're changing is actually making an improvement and when we talk about the process and outcomes measures um, we'll differentiate between those a little bit um, but those are the two things that go underneath of that category. Then what changes can we make that will actually result in an improvement and once you kind of analyze the three first sections of the model for improvement then you put them into the PDSA cycle which is a short repetitive cycle that will let you kind of do it over and over and over and say, okay, I did this, does that make a change before you generalize it and find out that it's going to fail or may potentially fail. So it will save you some time in the long run if you use that. So three fundamental questions are aimed. So he mentioned how good and by when. So we need to have a target. Do we want to be in the top 10%? Do we want to be in the top 25%? Do we want to decrease a time by X number of minutes? Do we want to decrease the number of infections by such and such percent, as Greg mentioned in the NICU? So we really have to come up with a very specific and obtainable aim. And then when we measure it, our process measures refer to, um, so let's say we have a process put in place for hand washing. We're going to use a checklist. We're going to have guidelines to go by. So looking at your process measures are is, is kind of analyzing are people actually following this guideline that we've set forward so it looks at your team and who's cooperating with the the guidelines that you have made and then the outcome measures look at are you actually doing what you wanted to do are you decreasing the number of infections are you decreasing the time that it takes to get from the door to seeing a doctor as far as um, patient time so you have to look and see if you're actually meeting those requirements and then changes you say what changes can we make in order to allow us to meet these um, results and then we track all of our data and we end up going from step number three back up into our aim. And so we see if our changes actually reflect what we wanted to do. So that's the first portion of the model for improvement. And Greg's going to talk a little bit about change and then we'll finish up this section with the PDSA cycle. So change, it, it, it's almost like a curse word in, in the hospital setting, right? When, when you mention the word change, um, the good thing, I see for, for us, we're in the NICU, it's either the nurses or the staff in the NICU are all tired of that word and they just ignore it or we're getting less reactions from them now as we go through many changes. But, you know, I, I actually searched, used the word change in Google and found all these different meanings from a revolution to something modifying, something different, something to replace. And, and unfortunately, in the healthcare setting, one of the quotes I like is, was from, John, from Kennedy himself, from JFK, is changes the law of life. And those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. So when you do change, I will always, you know, always you have to go back to what Erica said, this model for improvement. What do you want to do? How do you know you're doing better? How much do you want to improve on? And what are the things you need to do? So just like in our healthcare setting, there was a, an image um, I found 
um, in our healthcare setting of how, co how complex our system is. So, like for instance, for us, one of the clinical aims we said was, let's decrease the number of infections in all those infants that are less than 1,500 grams from 31.5% to 25.2 by December 2010. And we said almost like a 20% decrease. And this was a two-year project. We started in 2008. I showed you the data we had until 2008. Unfortunately, like I said, is this is what our healthcare system looks like. So this is a true roundabout in the United Kingdom, and there's small circles there. Fortunately, our roundabout over at Mile Ground doesn't look like this, but, um, but, and they actually have instructions in how to use this roundabout. This is how you use them, and they have this sign. This is what our healthcare system looks like. This is what the system in the hospital looks like. So what our job when we do QI is we need to find a way to simplify this, to find a way through this maze and figure out what's the best thing to do. Now we call, I call that process mapping is what the QI world would call it. And what does process mapping um, mean? What it is, is it's really, like for our babies, is for, when I'm admitting a baby to the neonatal intensive care unit, what does this baby go through from day one to the last day that we're discharging this baby? Who are the, who are the people that this baby is exposed to? What are the processes they're exposed to? What equipment do they need? And so we create a process map. So for an infection control, an example, and don't mind this small letter, so I'll actually highlight them later. But we said they come from the delivery room, then we admit them to the NICU, then we, they're, they're acute care, their first week of life, their second week, and their third week. And if, if I were to highlight one part of it, during their first week of life, what equipment is around them? They have an incubator to keep them warm. So they have an incubator. We have to think about how do we clean this incubator? Is this incubator that's very humid inside and warm is what they say is almost a zestful for bacteria. How often do we need to change this? Do we actually change it? Um, especially when they're very sick. Um, the nursing workspace. We're th talking about infection. Who's responsible for cleaning that? Who's responsible for the patient care counter, the non-patient care spaces? The ventilators, who's responsible for cleaning and maintaining the ventilators, um, um, are decreasing ventilator-associated pneumonia or any infection associated with it. Pick placement, these are central lines. By this time, these babies need a new central line. Who inserts them? Do we insert them the right way? And do we maintain them the right way to prevent infection? And hands-on care for both our staff and even family. What about their personal items that they use in the NICU? When, I, when we gather this, so you, you look at the who's responsible, what equipment, this is actually how you identify your team. That's where your process map helps in identifying your team. Because you know, we're used to setting up, there's two physicians or there's two nurses that likes to do a QI project. And I'll lead this project, I'll design everything, and then we'll come up with a new policy, and then we'll send the policy over, gets it approved, and we send an email to everyone, there's a new policy here you need to follow. In the QI world, that's actually the worst thing you could do and the least effective in terms of making any change or even any improvement is policy making. Policies are important, but if that's your driver, that's one of the least effective ways. And what you need is actually a team. You need everyone involved for you to understand the system. As a physician, this is the part of the NICU I understand, but I actually don't know how our housekeepers clean our incubators whether they're disassembling it appropriately. I don't know how the bedside is being cleaned, how our nurses change lines. So, so you do need your team to make that improvement. And then after you form your team and you have your process, then that's when this key driver diagram comes in play. And this is really just a diagram. It's a fancy word, but what it just means is if this is your aim, so infection, these three things, or four or five, which would you call your primary drivers, would be what are the things that would help improve that? What are the things that will help you reach this aim? And then the secondary drivers are really what are the things that you need to do to help you get to your primary driver? And it really, what this does is it helps you identify the tasks you need. Because at the end, your secondary drivers would be the ones that you would say, these are all the tasks that we need to do to reach this and eventually get to our aim. So an example we did, so infection control. So our clinical aim was infection, and we said, 
I think we need to do excellent hand hygiene. We did literature search. In excellent hand hygiene, the use of the central lines, it has to be safe, it has to be used appropriately. Our environment has to be clean, and we need to have a culture of quality and safety in the NICU. And from there, what does excellent hand hygiene mean? It means that everyone needs to wash their hands. 100% needs to wash their hands. Fortunately, as simple as hand washing, the national rate of hand washing is very, very low. It's less than 50% um, from healthcare workers. And there was, I think there was almost eight years ago, if they were to compare the amount of hand sanitizers or alcohol, those alcohol-based gels that we use here in the United States, the United Kingdom uses more than the entire country, our entire country, which is um, a huge difference. But, and then technique, you know, 100% of them could be washing their hands, but are they doing it right? We actually did the nothing below the elbow. We actually have our program in the NICU. Like if I were to walk into the NICU, I have to take off my watch, my rings, there was nothing from our elbow to our fingertips. Um, and you know what, this was a big battle from rings, but this is where your culture comes into play. You know, everyone was asking, is there evidence that it affects patient care? It makes them more infected. What we looked at was there is evidence that there's more bacteria in it. No one could link it to increased infection. But you know what? If it's the right thing to do, why, why not do it? Why wait for all this evidence in the world to come up? If it's the right thing to do, then why not? And then no white coats. Because, like, for instance, if you were to ask, I'm a physician, and I apologize for the physicians in the room, but how, how often do you wash your lab coats? They don't get washed every day. And how many times have you been in contact with a patient that you think is infected? Each day. So think of your lab coats. So, and then cell phone use. You know, there's an article in Time four or five, around four years ago where... E. coli was actually present, and the article actually said that stool is frequent in everyone's phones. So um, there's fecal material in your phone. Um, and and we actually, we're actually posting that into the NICU, that article in the NICU, because that's, unfortunately, that's true. One of the most frequent, um, I think one of the most frequent damages to cell phones or claimed damages is it fell in the toilet. So, so cell phone use. Um, it's an inevitable technology. We use it for point of care. But what does it affect in terms of your infection control? So this is just an example of a key driver diagram. I won't go through all of them, but this is what we did. We identified key driver diagrams. And, and I'll give you an example of just why is culture of quality and safety important? So, so the story I always tell was, so we, at one point we did very well in the NICU. We've done well, our infection rate was low. And there was one month where we had this spike. And I walked into the NICU and everyone was upset. They were all talking about it, asking why it happened. We need to look at this and look at that. And one of our managers or clinical preceptors approached me, why are you so happy? Didn't you see our data? And I said, yeah, I did. And, but but <laughs> why are you smiling? Because everyone is so upset that, you know what, we don't blame our babies anymore. We don't say that they're premature and that they're their immune systems are weak, and that it's inevitable they'll get an infection. We don't blame them. We, we say now that there is something that we could do to prevent this. So when you, when you start the QI, so, so you, you've identified your change, you've formed your team, you're about to launch your project. And Erica will go through more about the PDSA cycle. But where do you fall among this, amongst these people? Are you an innovator? Where you know what, it's all about patient care. Let's get out of this box and do things what's right. Are you an opinion leader or an early adopter where you've seen the evidence, this is the right thing to do, let's go ahead? The early majority where I agree this will be good for us as soon as all of these are in place. The late majority, if I really have to, um, that's where you force, no, it's policy. You know, they even ask, is this policy already? Because if it's not, maybe not yet. Um, and the laggards, these are the traditionalists. Um, and what, these are the ones, we've been, this is what we've been doing for decades. It's not gonna work. And this is what we've, we've done. And I don't really see the point of making this change. We'll do better next time. And when you actually look, so Rogers actually described this, is if you look at this graph, 
Your innovators are what? Around 15% or 16% of your population. Your laggards are also 16%. And you have your early majority and late majority that falls under here. And at one point in time, actually in the NICU, we had a lot of, I always have to be conscious about this, senior nurses. Uh, I don't want to make the mistake of saying the wrong word. Senior nurses, senior and experienced nurses and staff. Um, and majority of our staff were actually traditionalists. The, do we, why do we need to change? But if you look, the more common part is your laggards are really a minority, except they're louder. And one of the things I tell our nurse manager, you'll never get rid of them. They will always be there. You just need to get all of these to be louder than they are. And, they'll, and that's when you'll see them quiet down. So always going back, this should always be your framework. What, are, what do we want to do? How will we know that it is an improvement? How much do you want to change? And what changes are to be made? And only then will you then get all these ideas and put them in your PDSA cycle. All right. So hope the theory that repetition is the best method of learning is working for you guys, right? So if we talk about AIMS measures, changes in PDSA cycle enough, you'll walk out of the room and you'll be able to remember this. So as Greg um, so well introduced, we have to get people involved on the team. We have to come up with our goals and objectives. We have to talk about our aims, measures, and changes. And then we have to put this all into our PDSA cycle. So this is really kind of the ground level view of what we want to do every day. The 10,000 foot view we've talked about a little bit, and now we're really down to the ground level view. So it's a four phase process. It's plan, do, study, and act. Um, and the features of the PDSA cycle is that it is quickly allowing us to test changes underline or circle the word quickly um, and that is on a small scale so it's not that we spend forever talking about our aims measures and changes and try it out for a complete year to see if it's going to get us what we want it's really something that we can try on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis if we want to do a little bit longer PDSA to say is this working or do we need to go back to our aims measures and changes and change up our idea a little bit so it's done on a small scale we do it we see what happens we tweak the changes and then we test it again and the key concept is that it's rapid testing and learning if it's working or if it's not working. So some real life examples, I think it's something that we can apply to everyone. These are little PDSA cycles that we do in our life every day without really understanding. It goes back to the concept that QI really is this omnipresent concept. Um, we just don't think of it this way a lot. So the first example, I ate breakfast this morning instead of skipping it like I usually do. That worked out pretty well for me. I felt energized. I wasn't hungry by the time lunch came. So that was an example of a positive PDSA cycle. The second one, I took the train to class this morning rather than riding the bus. It ended up taking longer on the train and it was more expensive. So maybe the next day you're going to tweak your cycle and you're not going to take the train, you're going to go back to the bus. Third example, instead of writing out notes while in class, I tried to type the notes into my laptop. That was a total disaster. I missed half the lecture trying to tap feister, tap, type faster than my skills allowed. So another example of something that we can do in real time, we can understand very quickly whether or not something is working or not working, and then we go back to the drawing board, so to speak, tweak things, and figure out what we need to do to move forward to be more successful with our next PDSA cycle. So Greg will go into a little bit more detail about doing this at our level, like I alluded to a second ago, going from the 10,000 foot view and bringing it to our own departments, our own clinical settings. So you have your QI project, you've, you've gone through your PDSA cycle. So, so what are the things that, uh, you know, where are we now? For, for instance, for the NICU, where would we be? So, you actually have to prioritize. You have your aim. What, what do you do? You, you, you start, suddenly start thinking of a thousand, you know, a hundred, uh, not a thousand, a dozen projects. You said, I need to do better at this. I need to look at this and do better. What we use is a grid. So in the NICU, we've been doing QI. We've only been doing QI recently. We've been doing it over the last four years. And that's actually recent compared to what other institutions have already done. And we have to prioritize. You have to look at what is a project small or big? Is that your small? How much of an impact would it be? Is it a big impact or a small impact? Because the big projects with a small impact, that's not a good place to start with. And even more experienced QI folks, this is actually very hard. Because this could be a win or lose situation. This could be a point where your own staff gets tired and says, we can't do this. It's not really working. 
Um, then you have your small projects. I'm a pediatrician, so I love rubber duckies. But you think of rubber duckies. They're good for everyone, right? From someone who's a year old or less to someone who's older. Every, so everyone smiles when they see a rubber ducky. I like that rubber ducky over at Pittsburgh, that huge, giant one. It came. Um, and then you have your small project, big impact. These are your low-hanging fruit. This is the win-win situation. This is where you just do a small project, but it has a huge impact through your, through your department. And then you have your big project, big impact. Make sure you have a team. You make sure you have a QI team or, or a group of people who will be working on this because this will entail a lot of effort. And then after you prioritize, one of the things you also have to think of is, are your stakeholders. Um, and who are the stakeholders? These are the people that you look at and say, I need support from this. Or I'm having issues with this. I need help um, trying to counter this one. And I divide this in a grid as well. Those who are in interested in what you do, those with low interest, and there's actually support stakeholders that have higher power or influence, and those with lower power or influence. So, um, and I always, fo one of the th things you focus are those, those who are highly interested in what you do and has high power or influence. Engage them, make sure they always hear what you're doing. They, they see the results of what you've done. Um, let them hear your gripes, let them hear the things that are working because these are the very people who will be instrumental in making your project a success. You're, those with high influence, with low interest, keep them satisfied. You know, let them hear your data, let them hear your successes. Let them hear, I guess you could say, they can hear what they want to hear as well. But keep them satisfied in the loop because if you need help from them one day, they're there. And then you have your high interest, low power influence. Keep them informed. Keep them well informed where you are in the process. They may not have the influence or the power, but they will be valuable people that resources for you at the latter half of your project. And those with low interest and low power, just keep an eye on them. Because um, your resources are limited and you can't spend Sometimes, sometimes you spend 50% of your time trying to deal with um, people who are not very interested in what you do and they don't have influence in the success of your project. Um, so what happened to um, our NICU? Oh, I guess we're missing one slide. But what happened to our NICU? So this is our NICU. So, so at least you could see 2002. We started RQI efforts in 2008. And our infection rate actually significantly went down from there and has, we're actually at the top quartile right now with the network in terms of our infection rate. Um, that skin infection I told you about, we went to the really top quartile there. We have a small blip in 2012 and 13, but we've driven down. There's a big difference. And when you actually look, so, so we have around 100 of these VLBWs a year. So this is what, 30% would be our highest? So 30% of our 30 infants a year gets an infection. One infection in the NICU means you could either be dead, you don't get discharged and you die, or you, you get significant disabilities. That's how de debilitating one infection in the NICU is. And out of those 30 babies, we're actually down to, even here, we were down to 5%. We went down from 30 to 5 in just one year. If we did not improve and stayed here, we wouldn't have been able to save 25 other babies just for one year. And if you look at this at the 10-year period, that's around um, 200 babies that we prevented an infection on, if you just even look at the numbers. And the graph I'm missing here, I guess we updated this, is remember this, the, the image I showed you earlier where all our dots were above that black line? We're down to, I think, four or five dots. Everything's actually within the line. Half of them are within the line. Mo a lot of them are actually under the line. And we're doing better than the network. When I see that, then this is a place where I want to send my baby at and get taken care of. So, no, the one thing it, I would put at the end is, so, so I'll, I'll tell you this, so this is our most um, updated data. In terms of most updated data, overall we're still doing well. But you know what, the last couple of months, this 2014 didn't start out right. We, we, we came to a point where we did not have a single central line infection for 700 days, and that's unheard of in NICUs. 
For 700 days, we did not have a line infection. We had one in January, we had two in Feb, and we have one in April. So that's, that's significant for us. Compared to the national, we're still very low. But for us, that's actually very, what, what's going on? And everyone's actually searching right now. What's happening? Are we not doing things that we're supposed to do? Or is this, you know, is this a blip in our data? Or is this something real? And one of the things I always have to rem you know, remember is, and I've done these talks for several departments and um, venues like this, and I've shown them our success. But I can't get ho hooked up to that because, see, people all, are all over the world telling their one dramatic story. So I'm telling you my dramatic success and story. Now their lives are more about the past than their future. Is that you end up getting stuck in your own success and you end up forgetting the processes that you've changed to get you there. Um, so, so be careful. And that's where standardization is actually important. Because sometimes once the project's over, all, you know, all the energy, the momentum's down, and people stop doing what they're supposed to do. And that's why policies are not as effective. That's where culture becomes much more effective. All right, so how do we move towards getting people bought into the theory that QI is important? We've talked to you about why it's important. We've talked about how to develop the model for framework and the model for improvement. And now we have to really figure out how to get the people on our team motivated. We've talked about who needs to be on the team, but they really have to understand the concept. Um, they have to be drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak, or else it's just going to be you back to your individual self trying to pull all of this off. Um, and that is usually not a very successful um, a successful plan in the world of QI. So for the last few minutes of the talk, we're actually going to talk about, instead of project design and development, development we're going to talk about curriculum design and development. So I see a lot of people in the audience that are either residents or members of residency leadership. Um, so as for a show of hands, how many people actually have a part of their curriculum devoted to quality improvement and talking about the framework and the methodology? Can you raise your hand for me? So a few people out there, that's great. Um, so in the past year, I think a lot of us um, in the residency world have been forced to look at this more closely because of the ACGME, the next accreditation system, the clear visits that are happening from institution to institution, and quality improvement is a huge focus of this. So when we've talked a lot about it before and made references to it, but haven't really been putting curriculum or plans in place, um, that's been kind of a shift of thinking for us over the past year, much by beating us down and saying, you have to do this, but we might as well take it in stride and get motivated to make a change. Change, right? So common knowledge of QI, we think everybody knows what QI is. Um, I think it's something we talk about. We talk about quality improvement. We talk about patient safety. We think that it's common sense to know this stuff. And we all agree that we, can, we have to avoid errors, particularly preventable ones, hospital-associated infections, medication error administrations, um, lots of things like that that we all understand and we just think is second nature to us. Well, of course we want to do this. Of course we want to give the best patient care. But um, for my residency program, it was a great program. I learned a lot in residency, but at the time, we were not really focused on quality improvement education. We didn't have a curriculum for it. We talked about it a little bit in m and um, Our medical directors would allude to it frequently, but it wasn't really taught. There wasn't a part of our curriculum that was devoted to it. It wasn't really fully understood, and we really weren't implementing it to the best of our ability. So that's what we've been focusing on um, within the past year in our own department. So my departmental goals when I set out to kind of tackle this and to get some sort of a curriculum um, into place last year, I wanted to fill this QI void. Um, I wanted to implement a meaningful quality improvement program that our residents and faculty could go through and they could actually start to understand some of the stuff that we have spent the first 45 minutes of the lecture talking about. And as I said earlier, um, there's lots of reasons that we do this. There's JCO that's forcing the hospital to do this, but at the residency level, there's the ACGME that's saying you must do this, you must show that this is being done, um, and you must continue to get all residents involved in QI projects. So specifically, we wanted to understand the basic principles of QI. We wanted to focus on the core methodology like we've talked about. And we wanted to make residents feel comfortable and actually empowered to get involved in projects. I think a lot of residents sit back because they don't fully understand. They don't feel like they're good enough. They don't feel like they have the knowledge to trudge forward and actually be a meaningful part of a team. So that was one of the big goals in implementing this curriculum was to get everyone on the same page, so to speak, and make people feel like, yeah, I can actually go out and do this. So how did we do it? So the key for us 
process was registering and subscribing to the IHI. So the IHI is um, pretty much an open source, there's an institutional subscription here, um, and all residents and faculty in the institution can subscribe to it. It's not hard. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can find curriculum that's already out there. It's been proven. It's very reputable, um, and we can access it today. Um, we can develop modules for our residents to do or assign modules for our residents to do today. It's not something that's going to take us a long time to establish. So we can already do this without reinventing the wheel. And then the second section was really assigning residents modules for completion. We did this in an asynchronous fashion instead of part of our conference time actually being in the conference room going through presentations or PowerPoints or small group discussions. We actually just assigned these asynchronously, meaning they could complete them at home in their pajamas or whenever they wanted to basically as long as they got them done within a time frame. We actually offered them um, to our faculty as well. We assigned them to our residents and threw them out there to our faculty and surprisingly the majority of our faculty actually completed these as well. Um, we gave them detailed instructions on how to access it. It sounds kind of silly writing out every single thing, but that, that increases your promotion, um, increases your um, representation of your group, and they will participate more likely if you can give them detailed instructions on how to do it. We gave some deadlines for completion, and we did a little pre and post completion quiz, um, just assessing their baseline medical knowledge prior to and after completion of the modules. And we actually got some data that showed that people were much more knowledgeable of the basic concepts of QI afterwards versus before. And then recently we've developed what we call our QI Council within our department. And so as I said earlier, it's not an individual sport, it's a team sport. So we have a couple of members of our QI Council in the audience here. So Shelly and Steve um, are from the research section of our department and they are on the QI Council. Um, I'm on it as part of residency leadership. Um, we're going to have our medical director on it as well. And so we're, and then in certain projects we'll likely involve our nursing director, representatives from the pharmacy. Um, it depends on what sort of project you're doing. You may want to pull different people that actually work closely with that project onto the council at that time. But it's really important to have a group of, a, a team of people that can kind of understand the baseline foundation and then spread that um, to the rest of your faculty. And as Greg pointed out in his kind of bell-shaped curve um, earlier, you know, you have your early adopters and your late adopters, and those are the people that make up the majority of them. So you really have to get all of those people really bought in and to understand the importance. So our curriculum structure, it was a one month curriculum um, where we did this last August. So this was the first year we did it. So we actually had all 27 of our residents go through this with the hopes that in the future, um, our new interns can go through the curriculum as well and then we can kind of all proceed forward as a group. Uh, we had QI themed lectures. So Greg actually came as a guest lecturer for our department and talked about um, some of his expertise and some of the projects that he has um, so, so well done in the NICU. Um, I gave a brief introductory lecture. We actually started implementing um, a QI analysis in with our m, &M. So m, m I think is something that a lot of residencies do um, and we, we do it. Our residents love it. They always want more of it because they feel like it's very beneficial but that's like a prime opportunity to actually do some actual quality improvement projects or identifying projects that you can move forward with in the future and we weren't previously taking the benefit of that to actually taking advantage of that benefit to actually say this is what we're going to do as a project from that and move forward. We would have a discussion and that would kind of be the end of it and then every one would worry about that particular case for a week, but we didn't really move forward with a project. Um, so that's something that we started doing, and then we did the in, in the asynchronous modules, as I reported earlier. So some of the modules that we picked, there's multiple modules on the IHI site, but we picked the fundamentals of improvement, model for improvement that we've talked about today, putting it all together, how it works in real healthcare settings, and the human side of quality improvement. So they went through all of these modules, um, and then that's where we are now, is developing projects with our QI Council in order to carry this knowledge forward and actually hopefully make a meaningful change. So putting a QI spin on things that you're already doing, this goes back to the m, m as being a perfect example. So we now save 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our m, m discussions, and that's kind of our QI focus of the discussion. And that's where we actually go through and we say, what types of errors were in this case? Some cases don't really have errors, they're just bad outcomes that you can't really control, but some things there really are judgment-based errors where the, where the physician just didn't do the standard of care, or they could have gone one way but went the other way instead, um, which caused a bad outcome. There are based errors. Maybe the medication was delayed from pharmacy. Maybe the result, result from the lab was delayed for a really long time and that held you up. Um, maybe there were multiple other scenarios going on within your department or your clinic that was keeping you from taking care of a sick patient. So we really analyze and kind of do a mini root cause analysis to say what was the problem um, in this case. And then we use that discussion to identify future QI projects. We usually send around a summary email for the group. A lot of our residents and faculty come to m, m but for those that can't be there for DDR violations or whatever reason, um, 
um, we send around a summary email and of course we don't send any confidential details of the case we just kind of give a generalizable thing about this is the QI focus of our M&M today and a potential idea for a future QI project um, and always make sure to maintain confidentiality especially when talking about the M&M cases but it's a perfect example of where you can truly put a QI spin on something that you're already doing and bring this into your curriculum. So as an institution, um, Greg has really been um, a great leader within our institution on how can we get quality improvement expanded within the GMEC um, so that all departments aren't reinventing the wheel. We're all having some framework to go by. And that's really our goals and plans for this upcoming academic year as far as the GMEC committee goes, um, is that we've kind of developed a similar curricular plan using the IHI modules. And our future goals would be to actually enforce resident um, completion of the curriculum track resident attendance. So right now we have residents that go out and be on different hospital QI committees, the pneumonia committee or the blood transfusion committee or what have you committee that residents go to. And right now residents may or may not know they're on the committee or they might show up or they might not show up or they might have someone go in their place if they can't go. Um, and a lot of them sit there feeling like they're not worthy to speak up or have an opinion. So we really want people to feel like they're an inter integral part of the team as far as getting our residents involved. We're working on developing a standardized reporting tool for each department to fill out that goes back to the GMEC level so that we can document how we're doing from the institutional standpoint on completion of these projects. Um, and we really want to increase the participation of our residencies in the WBH Quality Improvement Fair, um, which has happens usually every year in May. So we really would like to see the number of QI projects grow. I think we've seen the number of research projects grow tremendously over the past several years. And we really want to start growing the QI portion of that because that is a really important area of discussion. And of course, the IHI Open School um, is available for all residents and faculty, like we talked about before and it's just ihi.org and it's very easy to access and if we have any questions on how to do that then we can help you as well. This is a picture of our institutional curricular timeline that we'll be implementing in this coming year so it kind of just has a timeline of each month. Um, you can see the curriculum periods one, two, three, and four. Um, so those are when you're actually going through the modules and then in between the curriculum period you will have small group workshops as well as meetings with an identified mentor and having an identified mentor is a really important part of getting off the ground um, with a QI project, someone that you can go to who's had experience with it before and really gets you started. That's an example of what we're going to try to do in the upcoming year as far as the GME subcommittee goes. So a quick summary on the curriculum develop development section um, is that you have to use a curriculum. Most of the research out there, there's not a ton of studies on how to teach QI, but most of the studies will not really recommend a specific curriculum, but they will say that your success rate is higher of getting your team bought in if you have some sort of curriculum. Whichever curriculum you choose, it's a higher success rate if you have some sort of curriculum versus just telling people, hey, you need to learn about QI. Um, you need to form a team. It needs to be interdisciplinary. It really is a team sport. It's not an individual project. And then coming up with project ideas like Greg talked about earlier, you really want to pick a project that's going to be a high impact project. So I think a lot of times we look into the very devastating outcomes. We'll find one case that thankfully doesn't happen very often, but we'll say, okay, that was a bad outcome. So maybe we should do a QI project around that. But it's really hard to do a successful QI project and use your PDSA cycle in quick fashion if you're looking at something that only happens once every Every five years or once every 10 years. So really look down at the ground level and say what happens on a daily basis? What is something that's really frustrating to me on a daily basis when I'm in the in the emergency department or when I'm in the clinic or when I'm wherever you are? Like look at things that are kind of nagging or hassling to you and that sometimes can give you a good QI project idea. Um, and if your hospital goals and your department goals align, um, then you know, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone, so to speak, if you pick something within your department that aligns with the hospital goals and the expectations of them. And then we use the model for improvement, of course, like we spent a lot of time talking about to move forward with our project. And I think this is a really important thing to remember is that the fundamental of improvement is every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And the only way to get a different result is to change our system. So we're kind of just pulling the wool over our eyes if we think, yeah, we're going to do better next time. We're going to get better results next time. But if we don't do something to the current method of how we're doing things, then we're likely not going to get a different result. So that's an important take home point. There's a few references that we have and we'll take any questions that you guys have. Yeah, go ahead.
Um, so, so actually, we've started talks with the IRB, and the next talk of this series is actually the IRB presenting their perspective in QI. One of the guides that I've used is if you look at the Health and Human um, I can, HHS website, <laughs> the HHS website, if you look at their FAQs on QI, so, so, so how they define QI is what you really need to do is if you're trying to gain new knowledge, that's research. What QI really is, is the application of that knowledge. So for instance, you, there's, there's several studies that says this is potentially best practice. And it's been established already in the research world that it's a, you know, it, it improves outcomes. Applying it in your setting would be a quality improvement project. And it's because you're not testing whether it's going to work or not. It's been established already. You're just testing whether it's going to work in your setting because you have a different type of system. The other thing that you think of, whether IRB is involved, and this came from the IRB themselves, is that if, you, if the question, you, know, you have to ask the question, if I were to present, let's say I'm going to present my project to you, if you are able to identify a patient from the data I'm giving you, then that's not, that, that needs IRB approval because that's protected health information. But you, no, not for quality improvement, because you do that for m and if you're doing a quality improvement project, you should be able to access data that it's your quality improvement for your unit or for your department. But if you're going to present that data, let's say in a regional setting outside of WVUH or WVU, then if any of those data, if, you, if someone can identify that's me or that's my son or my, my kid, then that needs an IRB. Um, approval and we are trying to actually define those limits much better um, we one of the things and, and I'll update in where we are right now the last discussion I had with the IRB they've actually agreed that we could form a group within the institution that's going to be composed of people familiar with both QI research and the IRB and that QI projects could actually filter through that group and that group will say no this needs IRB approval you need the IRB versus not to try to expedite the process. Yes. yes. One of the things that we're finding as we are taking QI results out to our professional journals is that they are requiring a letter either from the IRB or a committee that you just described to accompany the manuscript. Yes. Um, so it is important that you get either a written letter from your type of committee you're talking about where you do have to Yes, and actually, thank you for that. That's actually very important. We did discuss this with the IRB. So the intent to publish does not need an IRB thing. This is from the FAQ from the HHS website. But each of the journals have their own requirements. And if you look at some of the major journals, that's one of the requirements they have. Is it ha They have to say that it went through the IRB and it has this language that it's non-human subjects research. Because what confuses a lot of people is the thought that you're going to patient data and getting that data, it's already human subject research. May not, as long as it's de-identified and you're dealing with data, it's not. But if you do have an intent to publish, our advice is actually look at the journals you're intending to send them to. Because if that's a requirement for the journal, then it doesn't matter what anyone else says. The journal wants one for publication. Now, if your intent was really to do a QI project, see, this, the difference, and this is the gray areas, um, is to say you do a, when you do a research project and you start collecting data and then you don't get IRB approval, the IRB will tell you you can't use that data for your project. And that's, but if you're doing a QI work, that data is, you, you, know, you have access to that data and you could use that data to report your QI work without, um, the IRB's pre-approval because your primary intent was actually just to collect the information. So, so it does lie in this gray area and we're trying to actually um, make that line a little bit clearer for our institution. So now that it's starting up and this is something new, there's a lot of struggle with that. 